Good afternoon, everyone. We are here today at the Beverly Hills Bar Association. My name is Natalia Aranovich. I'm a lawyer in Brazil and California, and I'm the co-chair of the International Law Section of the Beverly Hills Bar Association. We have uh, lawyers from all over the world in our section, including Italy, Spain, Romania, Brazil, Portugal, and Africa, and several other countries. So we decided to put together this uh, video program about the legal aspects of the coronavirus. Virus. And today to talk to us about this is the Vice President of the Beverly Hills Bar Association, Malcolm McNeil. Malcolm has over 35 years of experience in litigation and, com and commercial experience in a wide variety of matters, including business, commercial, construction, defect, and especially international uh, law. He also has an expertise in cross-brothers negotiations and has established a network of colleagues through the globe, assisting foreign countries as needs arise. Know for his leadership and accomplishments, particularly for clients with business interests in China, Malco is a panel member of the Shenzhen Court International Arbitration, the Beijing International Arbitration Commission, and the Harbin Arbitration Commission. Malco serves as the co-leader for of Iron Fox International Group. Thank you very much, Malco, for being with us today and share your knowledge. Thank you very much for the invitation, Natalia. It's my pleasure. Um, if we're going to talk about the legal aspects of the coronavirus, there's two, two things we should be talking about. The first should be the current impact of the coronavirus and how it's impacting businesses today, which is more obvious, but I'll touch on those anyway, just so that we're, we're all on the same page. And also, I'm in the process of putting together a piece on the coronavirus and the impact on business post-coronavirus, because I think that what's going to happen is that some of the norms that we uh, use to advise clients uh, are going to change as a consequence of the implications of the coronavirus and the, uh, the duties of companies uh, in terms of their employees and their shareholders, and finally, uh, uh, how they react to, say, the uh, public outcry and the public fear and concern in these environments, and how those affect things um, from, a, from a business standpoint and how they operate their businesses. Um, and also, I think what we have to do presently is we have to be in a um, uh, in the mindset that right now, as we live through this, as we're talking right now in mid March, that the we're in the middle of a political season, and as as such, we know that unfortunately this adds to the um, to the fear uh, and and the concerns, and it it spreads a larger number of unknowns because. People are hearing competing information about the virus, and consequently, they don't know necessarily what to believe, and that in turn exacerbates their concerns. Um, so one of the things that I'm telling clients these days is to be very, very careful about what you buy into and what you hear and consider the source and determine whether or not it looks like it's a reliable source or if it is, in fact, something that is being used as a political football in this season. But what I'm hearing from clients, uh, the majority uh, right now, are, uh, you know, what do we do with our present operations? And, and that breaks down into a whole series of questions depending upon what sector of the economy the client is coming from. Uh, the obvious issues are that we're hearing that there's there's disruptions in the supply chain. We're hearing that there's disruptions potentially in the in the delivery of um, uh, pharmaceuticals. Uh, that that China may be weaponizing pharmaceuticals uh, at some point, and that there may be shortages. Uh, Apple has made announcements on its website that perhaps certain of the components that go into its products, primarily iPhones, may not be available from Foxconn. Um, there's there's also information from Ring that its its alarm systems may have a shortage of, of, uh, of uh, components. And so the, the, the first item that I talk about is let's is the supply chain. And I ask clients, not only is your supply chain secure from an intellectual property standpoint, but the next question is, is your supply chain uh, replaceable? at any point in, in, in the supply chain. Are you getting your product and your supplies and your components specifically from a single source? 
And if companies have thought that that's the appropriate thing to do in the past or that was adequate to do in the past, it is no longer adequate and they better reassess their activities. There are other places to go. If it's a low-tech product, are you looking at other markets that are uh, maybe making basic products and can you are you easily transferring your operations from say an affected area for example China to a Vietnam or a Malaysia or an Indonesia uh, and if it's a high-tech item do you are you able to get these components through perhaps another high-tech market such as uh, Taiwan or South Korea where they'll have a, a, a more sophisticated high-tech group of components or India for that matter so I think that the complacency that may have existed in the past is something that could very well uh, require reassessment by companies because they could face liability as a consequence of it. The liability could very well be that you could have a class action lawsuit coming from the shareholders complaining that the board and management did not approve do not properly assess the risk and create alternative supply chains in, in their in their business. Um, and, and, and the second area where people are asking me questions is uh, how do we how do we deal with our employees? We have a we have a, a whole I, I don't know how many now, but I will tell you that a month ago you started seeing reports that companies were advising their employees not to travel. It, it started with a travel advisory saying, we warn you to be careful if you're traveling. It then became a situation where companies up to the ante by saying, well, if you want to travel, you need to get authority from the management of the company. And in some cases, including one large pharmaceutical company that I'm aware of, they issued a, a, an outright ban on employees traveling throughout JPAC, through, from Singapore through uh, Japan. And now another uh, uh, announcement was made this morning that the company's employees cannot travel worldwide. And it sounds like that might be uh, some level of hysteria, but I mean, there is a good business reason for that. Because the biggest concern, besides having employees who would be reluctant to, to want to travel, is the issue of what if those employees uh, contracted the disease and the company had instructed them to go? Is there additional liability on the part of the employer for having asked the uh, employee to get into harm's way? So that becomes a, a, an issue that the company's management must be very, very careful about and I know that the very cautious in-house counsel are advising their companies, better, better you just stop travel entirely, better you start checking on our Zoom contracts, better you start uh, checking on our Skype contracts, better we accomplish all of these goals from a, uh, from a long distance uh, audio video standpoint rather than require everybody to have to go and travel and do the things that they need to do. Talking to anybody who has done international business, we all know that face-to-face -face meetings are, of course, the best way to conduct business, the best way to generate confidence, the best way for people to trust each other, and ultimately the best way to do business. However, uh, the best way to do business is not necessarily the best way to limit liability. So that's where those. That's why I think that kind of advice is occurring. So it's not so much that we have to worry about the coronavirus itself, and I'm not sitting here as a medical professional. What I am saying, though, is that there's other reasons other than the medical necessity to make sure that uh, businesses act properly and give the best advice. Um, also, you need to look at the, the, the sector of the economy that the company is coming from. Uh, we have a vibrant hospitality practice. I'm based on the West Coast in Los Angeles and San Francisco, and I'm our international co-leader for primarily the business that comes from, uh, say, the Asia-Pacific region. The firm on the East Coast and our Boston, New York, and D.C. offices do primarily inbound European work, although we, it all, it, obviously those lines are blurred with, with clients that we handle. But at the same time, that, that's the, the, the emphasis that the firm has. And what we see is, for example, in hospitality, we all know everybody's heard about the cruise ships. Everybody knows about the, 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 the cruise lines that, that are uh, unfortunately suffering uh, uh, a situation where they're giving a couple of weeks extra time on the cruise ship on their for their cruise that they paid for and that's because of the quarantines and the and the cases that have arisen so it doesn't take a, a legal wizard to sort out that that's going to cause a, a an impact upon the entire cruise industry and to what extent it will continue into the foreseeable future or if the industry will recover as a whole well time will have to tell 
but that, that of course combines with the airlines, that combines with hotels themselves. We've seen some hotel chains that have had 80 plus percent um, of their um, uh, their occupancy rates are reduced to 7% and 10% and 12%. And the problem, as everybody knows, in the airline business and in the uh, hotel business, that's inventory that's lost forever. You can't store it in a factory and bring it out later and sell it. It's lost forever. So the impact, the, the question is who will be impacted by that? Clearly, there will be some that will be able to weather that storm. And the question is going to be for those companies, what kind of disclosures do you make to your, uh, to your customers and to your shareholders? What kind of accommodations do you make to your customers in the meantime? You're already seeing some airlines providing flexibility for how they're going to use the, uh, their tickets and whether or not they can trade them in or use them at a different date. But all of those have economic repercussions because the answer at the end of the day is there's lost seats. I received a report from one of my clients, which is a ground handling company at LAX, and there was a 300 seat, 280 seat uh, flight that had six seats that were that had the, the crew was larger than the than the uh, passenger list. So how long can that go? And now we're seeing that the Im the impact that that's having on the oil market. Okay, so that that will have a, a further rippling effect down the line as we watch how it goes. The stock market is reacting accordingly because the stock market the stock traders really don't know either. They don't know how long it's going to last. They don't know how long there's what kind of consumer. Um, uh, sensibilities will be affected by all of this and for how long. We do know that in the short run um, things have occurred, for example, in Hong Kong following the protests, they then had the coronavirus outbreak. So we know that there are places where restaurants are closed. Uh, I think I'd heard from one of my clients on the ground in Hong Kong that two of the malls closed. So the retail environment has, has now uh, been affected, especially the luxury retail market. So then the question is, how are those companies going to, again, uh, fend off the, the economic, um, I don't want to call it a disaster, but certainly the, the, the devastating economic impacts that that's going to have over those businesses over the next several months. Yeah, and just a question I have for you. I think in every crisis there is an opportunity. So don't you think that maybe now is an opportunity for an online business? Because, like I said, if the malls are closing, then who is gonna who is gonna make uh, some money with this? So it's a long online business. Are going to increase ways of meeting online meetings? I don't know. What do you think about that? I well, I, no. It, it's so funny that you say that because yes, I, I heard the. Uh, one of my colleagues many years ago when I was a young lawyer, that was many years ago, uh, said to me, uh, yes, with every uh, problem there's an opportunity. And the and, and I, I found in practice that it actually is, is quite true. And yes, online businesses will, will thrive. Uh, one of my clients told me that they have, they have a gaming company in China and because everybody had been housed and, and told not to leave their homes, that the video game uh, view Doing revenue went up 1,500% for one of these companies. Well, there you go. I've also heard an anecdotal story about a, um, uh, about a, uh, a food delivery company, that their, that their revenue has gone up. And of course, that had its own issues because then there were questions about whether or not the delivery person uh, had the coronavirus or not. So they were putting tapes on the packages showing what their temperature was to show that when they delivered it, they did not have a fever, so the food was okay. So maybe the person who makes those little uh, uh, temperature tags is making money. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the, the answer is yes, I do believe that there are opportunities. I believe that uh, for clients who are invested in the stock market, one of them came to me recently and said he put $150,000 into hospitality stocks, that he was watching them very carefully. And for those that were, say, the better, uh, let's say, better situated um, stocks with that were more well-funded, more well-known, that they were watching to see where how steep those prices would go because they knew that eventually those prices would go up. So, so there are opportunities, and, and I think that's why we hear uh, what I refer to as the superficial information, which we all sort of pick out from this. But underneath that, uh, we, we need to look at what the risks are as well as the opportunities. Yes. 
Thank you very much, Marco. It was a pleasure to have you here. My pleasure. And thank you. Thank you, Natalia.